Hello everyone, I'm Anne Flaherty and welcome to a very special interview for, from the Irish Cultural Centre in Hammersmith. Before we begin, we have a small favour to ask. We had a host of fundraising activities and celebrations planned to mark our 25th anniversary, but unfortunately these are on pause due to the impact of COVID-19. We remain as keen as ever to continue sharing the best of Irish culture with you, particularly through this difficult time, but we do need a little help. If you enjoy today's interview or have enjoyed any of the great content from ICC Digital or ICC on the radio or our culture hotline over the last several months, we would be hugely grateful if you would consider texting 70450 with ICC5 to donate five pounds, ICC10 to donate 10 pounds, or ICC25 to donate 25 pounds. Your donation will help support our work in the community, as well as ensuring that we can continue to create brilliant content to share with you all. We can't wait to welcome you back to the centre when it is safe to do so. But for now, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's guest, stand-up comedian, television presenter, bestseller writer, and very importantly, an ICC patron, Dara O'Brien. Welcome, right. Dara, and thank you for joining us today. No, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, ordinarily, of course, we'd be doing this interview face to face uh, at the ICC Centre or a hall somewhere. And uh, I'm just wondering, can you tell us how has the lockdown affected you? and your plans for work over the past year or so? Well, look, I, I, I know ordinarily I wouldn't do things face to face. I insist on there being some form of barrier, some form of shield. Um, a confessional booth is my preferred um, location for an interview. Um, I just I, I like the separation and I like the degree of um, formality involved in that. Oh, so it, it, there's, there's a whole power structure thing about who is who's the priest in this and who's not the priest. So, I, I, well, that, I can't be because you know we can't have women priests. So I'm obviously oh yeah ruled right, out. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Actually, yeah. So uh, okay, true. And actually, to answer, or, or atheist priest, I think is also a bit of a giveaway. Uh, so I think neither is get to be the priest, but still inherently there is a an element of one person is in the Lord's person. The other. Has it changed things? Uh, yeah, the <laughs> lockdown uh, lockdown ended my career essentially. The yeah, uh, there is a thing I say that um, there's a real clear split between um like like ice flows ice flows a break between younger comedians who um okay fine now i'm gonna learn to do tiktok and i'm gonna reinvent myself as a in the visual arts and i'm going to find and i'm going to do zoom gigs and i'm going to find ways of delivering content on different media platforms and then there were slightly older comics who went so this is what retirement is like okay i'll go into the garden now for a while and pick up a hobby um ed Byrne is making things out of cedarwood in his house i'm um, lee mack is gardening i just other comics i'm speaking to i bought various telescopes and take photographs of things and pour over them for hours trying to do you know photoshop on them to get the levels of uh new you know, new, yeah it's just it's not i don't get into why it's, uh, but it's incredibly compelling the, so i am yeah it's, it's it's you know there's there's a set of skills that i got trained for which really only work in front of a whole group of people and i have been denied the chance to use them for a year now and possibly another year and a half. In the, in the most dramatic part of it is that I was literally on the way. I just finished my first ever tour of America, four dates uh, in America. I was about to do my first ever tour of Canada. I was very excited about this and was in the airport about to check in when the call came. This is 12th of March, something going, this is all being pulled. So I had to do a mad dash from well, LaGuardia Airport to JFK Airport, which are luckily both on the same side of New York. Um, and have been to a taxi again, and then go all the way across the, and then race to the British Airways counter, and essentially bluff my way onto a plane and go. I need to get back to London. I was supposed to be getting a flight from Toronto in two weeks' time. Can I use it on this flight? And the kind person in BA said, "Of course you can. There's no problem at all. Look, I've got you onto a plane, and um, it leaves in 45 minutes." And I then found myself having to go try and going. Oh, no, I, I didn't mean like the, I did I, like I, I want to get like the flight in about two hours time. I know you've got about four flights. I don't want the one. I'm not in that much of a rush. I'd like to get a meal and do some duty free. But I'd made such a fuss of I need to go back to London that for no reason I had to run through the airport um, to get the plane 35 minutes later and then arrived onto the plane sweating and breathing heavily, which is exactly what everyone presumed a COVID patient looked like <laughs> last March. And I'm there dripping and heat coming off me and everyone else in the plane going, 
no, they were <laughs> stuck with him for six hours. This is wrong. Um, but yeah, as it turns out, false alarm. They, yeah, but I, so it was very dramatic at the start and then swiftly followed by a year of doing nothing. Absolutely. Well, you know what they say, never waste a, a crisis, you know, when there's an opportunity. Look, if there's a thing in it, if there's a mad, if there's, if there's a rush across an airport that I can, that I can dramatise for no effect. Mm. Yeah, I mean, but other than that, like it's, there's been, you know, because all live went and then briefly reappeared for the summer in either in front of cars, weirdly, or um, in socially distanced gigs where people were sitting in like fairy fort, like ring, you know the things, the fairy rings that people would draw on the ground. They, uh, that, they all had their own little ones of those and uh, they'd sit in a big field somewhere. And then, it, and we pushed them really to the start of October where it was getting very cold to sit outdoors for two hours of a show. And then it became this, we can't do this now. So we've, no one's done a live gig. We've done mock, we've done mock the week. That, that yes, with screens. Out. We did, and we did them. As they, we briefly had about three weeks where we had an audience in the room, and they were sitting out in a kind of a socially distant way. And that actually did was was worse than the Zoom because um, there was instead of being it's an old rule of physics <laughs> that it's always better to have the audience rammed into a room. Like when we book Edinburgh, when you're working your way up the levels of Edinburgh, there's some point where you go back a size of room so that your audience is a little bit too big for it. So suddenly you're selling out. Uh, and it's a bit of a cheap trick, but it works because a, a packed room, a packed room of 60 is better than a half full room of, of 300, weirdly. The, uh, mm. And so we found ourselves in Mock Week, suddenly our 250 seats were filled with 80 people. And it, it, just, it, it was it was distance and a bit awkward. And everyone was wearing masks. Mm. And so it became better just to focus on the, um, on the Zoom crowd because we had the intimacy of being in their homes. Mm -hmm. um, which was, you know, they, they all kind of got a bit giddy about it. There are people who could never have travelled down to London normally to see a show. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, there was a kind of a general, really upbeat festival. And they're sitting in their houses is the thing they've been looking forward to for weeks. The, uh, so it was a, uh, it was, it was, a, it, was a, it was an extra treat for them. But mm -hmm. it was a, um, uh, it made it, and there was a kind of a tension with it which is what you want to play with. Um, I'm sorry, while you're doing this, my wife is tippy into the room to take the computer game that my son wants to play is now tippy out of the room. Snapshots of life. Could uh, be worse. Could be a cat. It could be. Well, honestly, we had to. I had to expel the cat a few minutes beforehand. But there was a tension. There was a tension from people sitting in the front rooms and us talking down the thing directly at them, mm. actually being able to see them for the first time, which made it funny in itself. I used to tell them to go and find a weapon. That was one of the things we did one week. Go find a weapon, and then they would produce knives and stuff like that when we had a crossbow in his house um or they'd hide i'd say everyone hide and then we do a bit where i'm going hey where have the audience gone and it would be just empty seats and then they'd all emerge from behind their chairs like whatever so it became a kind of a giddy a kind of high you know upbeat kind of a fun it was a, honestly for a show that has weirdly a lot of baggage about it mock the week uh we were having a lot of fun and it ended up being a very fun series but mm. it's the only thing the only thing i've been able to mm. do for the last year and just thinking th just thinking there about what you said about you know about being on on on, on a, in the middle of a big tour or whatever and about to do uh, a trip to canada those big tours that you do um where you do you know you might do 150 nights not forgetting 37 nights in vicar street but it's really hard to actually imagine what that was like or to envisage that happening in the near future, isn't it? It's the idea of sitting next to strangers and having, you know, what you can't have people doing lateral flow testing on the way in, you know, by the thousands. Yeah, I, I think That's it's a bit it terrifying. Is, it's easy for me to imagine doing it than it would be for the audience, I think. I think yes, well, yes, you're, you're, yeah. I mean, you know, I, you, you'll be maintaining a social distance. I will, and uh, and I'll be mainly expelling droplets of water at people uh, rather than being the one having to absorb them. The, uh, so, um, and also, I am aching for a night away from home. <laughs> the, like, so is everybody else, Tara, by the way. <laughs> I know, but, you know, it's been, and, and like, you know, we did get away. We got over to Ireland during the summer, like, and sneaked into the place. We've had the odd, you know, trip when it was, po when it was possible to travel. But... This uh, at some point in March, it was the twelfth of March, whatever I presume it is, or the thirteenth, yeah. I will have been, I've spent three hundred and sixty four out of three hundred and sixty five days under the same roof as my family, and I haven't done that in twenty five years, and it's you know they're all suffering for it now. The uh, and so you know, you you kind of get used to a life where you just have these windows of travel built in, mm. which are like a valve. They uh, mm. and if you're the kind of person who needs that, yeah. So that's been that's been slightly weird, uh, but. The, that part of it, I, I seem to have gone back to easily. Writing is, in more, is also an issue. The, uh, as in, like, what the hell do you write about? Yes, what are you going to write about? Because if you, in the kind of observational comedy that, you know, that you're writing, yeah. surely that, that really relies on, you know, interacting with people, at, you know, at, at the very least. Oh, and, and not only that, what are you going to write about 
after a lockdown. Well, that's, can you that's write the jokes dilemma. about it or well, not? Well you, can, well, you can write jokes about it, but, but the thing is everyone else is writing jokes about it. We haven't found that there's been any... Weirdly, there was a um, episode of Mock the Week where we did um, every every first... The, the, the way the structure works is basically there's a long chat block and then there's some, uh, some standing bits and then there's another long chat block. So there's two large blocks. I mean, generally, there's one story for each, either a photo or a, um, a picture of the week or something, and it gets us into a chat, right? So there's two long blocks. The first block every week uh, for this block was COVID and vaccines and, and the situation, right? The second block was invariably American, um, just because that was the big story in January. And the... Uh, and there was one week where we did our response to the capital, the riots in the capital. The uh, and two people uh, on Twitter said, "Well, you've crossed the line there. You know, people died." And I went back going, "We did ten minutes about COVID just before that." The, uh, but suddenly, these individuals dying has affected you slightly more than the, the like the ten thousand people who died in the UK out of this thing. People were absolutely, look, we're, I, I think there is a human scope for dealing with tragedy and comedy and putting those two things beside each other far finer uh, than we give ourselves credit for. So the uh, so that part would be, be okay. I don't think anyone's going to go, how dare you joke about this? No, I mean that. more like sort of an apathy. Do oh, we, the, the, you know, that, that, do we right. not is, forget about it? That is absolutely the problem with it, which is that... Um, I think they're the point where right now all we all we see is is this co is locked out, but afterwards we will not want to think about lockdown at all. That's that's one theory. The other theory is that it'll take some disseminating and you know and this you know there should be some cultural artifact to it because interestingly the the there's plenty of films about the, about the first world war but no films about spanish flu because spanish flu doesn't have an enemy uh, and so therefore it kind of disappeared from our cultural landscape and then this thing suddenly roars back in uh, and it reminds me what a pandemic is but pandemics don't make great films and so they are great art to a certain extent the uh in the same way so but there has to be some sort of cultural artifact a shared experience of, there is i was and there has to be some chronicling of that but i think that's i kind of feel we've all so exhausted of it now that what we want is something different i think it's going to go silly personally i think it's going to go people will just want to be out in a room and just enjoy the madness of being in a room together and i think that's yes. something that taps into that so i think you may get an interesting generation of in the way that people said you know there are certain types of government create punk uh, or create angry pop music. The uh, this might create very silly comedy, very kind of just a total relief of look. It's, isn't it great just to be out and hear some is some nonsense? Mm. So I think the uh, I think we'll tend towards the nonsense. But like what how, what you write because observational stuff. Is, I generally write story. I tell stories of things that happened to me. Nothing's happened. Uh, so it's a very difficult thing to do. Or you'll chat. I don't know. I mean the gigs that I've done. The one thing that's really characterised the. Gig I've done is a slightly manic energy for me just from being on stage um, and that has been the, the defining thing is that I can't remember what material I chose to do they're just jokes uh, ultimately they're just the delivery they're just bullets in the gun as I used to say the uh, to, but it was just being on the stage the giddiness used to, that was the funniest thing about it was like oh my god look at this this is happening again it's great to hold a, hold a mic in my hand and the audience were just a giddiness of being out, of being, oh my God, we're at a gig. How amazing is this? And so I think that'll carry a bit of it. The uh, just, how weird is this? Wow, how great, we're doing this again. So I yes, think there's going to be yes. a bit of, we're doing this again. Yes. On the other hand, the one thing that has happened throughout this whole you know, lockdown is the, I suppose, the, the, the interest in science, because now we're looking to science to get us out of it. And wearing your other hat, mm -hmm. you know, that must be something you personally at home are probably, you know, crunching the numbers and looking yeah. at, you know, vaccine statistics and all sorts of things all the time. So that is, for example, um, I think nobody knew what an epidemiologist was before this and now you couldn't spell it everyone is an epidemiologist they are the rock stars <laughs> yes well everyone wants everyone uh, it has a guitar at home and uh they can play it there i think the uh there are a lot of air guitar epidemiologist rock stars uh, let's say uh on twitter the um I'm very happy to go that I that's not a field of science I, I know much oh. about so I'm quite very, always very happy to do to look as, as I do anyway one of the things I'm very happy to go they discovered it I'm just a guy telling you about it um, about this the uh, it is it, it, I wouldn't say it's been a golden ear for science because it has it, it has brought up as many people just giving nonsense. As I think it's, I mean, in a sense, historically, yes, it will be because they have managed to create a vaccine in ridiculously fast times with new methods involving RNA and manipulation and all these kind of things have, done, have been brilliant. They've mapped things and genome things. And it's like, yes, it is a snapshot of how far we've come as a species that we've done this so well. 
Um, but in terms of the public discourse, it's not like people going, hey, we should be, let's be quiet now and just, and let these people know more about this than we do. Have you heard that at any point? These people know when we, let's, let's let them talk for a while. Like, instead, no, it's been Toby Young and Newsnight. Like the, uh, and uh, it's like the media can't shift its desire to have balance in quotation marks. And that's all very well, Mr. He Head of Epidemiology. But now we have a guy who thinks lockdowns kill more people than than the virus and you're going but they but they really don't we can show you a chart the uh it's uh it, it's i don't think it's been in that regard in terms of the public use of science i suppose we we, we found ourselves as prone to just the, the garbled version of it that you get from people who just want to grab a thing that backs up what they wanted to say um so that that's still a thing um, mm, but yeah. I think in general, you know, in terms of the, the ordinary member of the public, I think there's a huge admiration and, and uh, uh, you know, thankfulness really for, for having the science, you know, I mean, that is the, the feeling that without that, where, you know, how do we get out of this? And surely that must be useful for, for, for you as a person who is engaged in promoting science and particularly, you know. Yeah, uh, look, absolutely there, there is. I mean, again, people are talking about things that they weren't talking about. I mean, but just for particularly serious reasons, I suppose. But the, uh, mm. but I suppose there is, I mean, and we're watching a live experiment taking place in how you, like in terms of public health, taking place in 187 countries at the same time. I mean, that in itself is incredibly interesting. Uh, I started this habit very early in the thing there. I'd go to the Johns Hopkins website and that's the one that has a map of all the countries and then you can just bounce on it and go to country, country, country and it has cases, deaths, all the, all the stuff like whatever. And I poured over that like at a time when it was neither good it wasn't particularly good for your mental health to do that as it was expanding up and then i just posted the other day that look the global cases are falling away and then you know people going yes but it's winter dar and i'll go yes it's a globe it's not winter everywhere it's not winter. Uh, okay. but it's winter in the places where you're going you know it's not winter in brazil for example uh, and so the you know you, you're always going to get some sort of weird flat earth thing going on but um, it was, we are watching a series of different experiments. The only thing is, again, the public thing is, gets hijacked by people going, but Sweden, and you're going, you mean the Sweden in March? Because the Sweden in, no, in November, they made a completely different decision, but you're still talking about Sweden in March. That kind of stuff like the, yeah. But New Zealand has, uh, my favourite of all the ridiculous conversations was the point where we're pointing out how well Ireland had done, because Ireland being a small, cohesive country had, you know, let's ignore the Christmas thing just for a second, but they stick a pin in that, uh, but had basically, but, collected together very, very well. Uh, I'd done the public health message very, very well and had controlled the initial bump very, very well. And people were pointing out, going, why, is, why can't Britain do this? These are the relative size of this, this, this. And people were going, population density, population density. You're going, yes, but the Ireland, our people in Ireland don't live in, in plots of land equidistant from each other. You know, they, they still live in cities and the population density of London is the same as population in Dublin. Like, so, so this isn't, a thing, but just there was, there were levels of, there were levels of stupid. And so I'd like to think that it led to a huge upsurge in public health and, and, and scientific knowledge. I'm not convinced it did. And, you know, there are people, there are people like who are campaigning outside of Guys and Thomas's, you know, saying that it was all a hoax as people were dying inside the hospital. Mm, you know, mm. it's, you know, there, I think we have an infinite capacity for both ends of the bell curve in terms of mm. being intelligent. Uh, That's so. human nature though, isn't it? You it know. is, I'm afraid, yeah. Mm, yeah. Now, the thing is, you did manage last year to bring this book out, Is There Anybody Out There? Mm. And that is a book about space. Um, two things that are ir irritating. Yes, it's a uh, young people and um, space. And it's the second book I wrote. With, I wrote a more general mm. book about space um, for kids, and I wrote another one book about. And it's the third yes. science book, second about space, and this one is specifically. Really, the whole alien thing is partly to go into thing called exoplanets and uh, the way we discover planets and how interesting that is. By the way, as a writer, you should be infuriated by that. There's one too many theirs in the title. I only realized that after the book. Is there out. anybody out there? there? I mean, is there? Is is there it, really, should it be? Is anybody, is anybody out, out there? there? Yeah. Or is, well, you is, should is, fire is, your editor for a start. Yeah, I know. But I mean, I'm, you know, I'm responsible for this stuff. The, uh, <laughs> so, um, but it, 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 so now bugs me every time I hear it. Is there any? Is there any to, Never anybody, mind. You can use that as the title better, for your next tour. The, um, <laughs> but it's a, uh, but yeah, it was, it was just because there's, um, the, just the discovery of stuff is is interesting. Yeah, the, uh, of course. The um, the, oh, God, I found which one it was. One of them was announced. One of the planets, what's the Uranus, was announced by Anagram because the guy who discovered it wanted to spread the information. We didn't discover any planets. For, for, we we knew the ones that we saw all the time. 
um, and they'd wander around the sky, and hence the name planet, which is Greek for wander. And then we started discovering them again in, in 1738. We started discovering them again when it was 100 years. But oh, we discovered the moons of things. I was, yes, it was one of the moons. The moons of Jupiter, I think, it was. the uh, were announced by anagram because the astronomer discovered them. Um, the information you can't just you can't send the information at, at, at the same time. So he wouldn't send a letter to somebody going, "Look, I've discovered the moon." In case the person would go, "Oh, it's funny, I have also discovered that moon, and I have sent a faster letter than you to the Royal Society to claim it." The, uh, so he sent out an anagram um, and said, "I will reveal what is in this anagram once I know you've all received the anagram." And once all the bodies received the anagram, then he sent them what the anagram was. Um, and so he basically placeholdered the information when I've discovered something, it's hidden in here, but it was like a 140 characters of Latin, so it was impossible to, to read. And then he sent them the key to the anagram and they went, oh, well done, congratulations. More science should be revealed by anagram. That should happen more, that we should have just a kind of like a game of boggle wherever we discovered. I mean, it wouldn't have been helped in a, in a, in a public health crisis like this one, had they had the Pfizer BioNTech people held back until we'd all solved the anagram. Mm -hmm. But and vaccine, there's no way I think vaccine anyway. Um, cava, um, cava in uh, anyway, but the, the little things like that, like whatever, just very, very sweet stories, or whatever. And it is, uh, you know, it's aimed at, at creating wonder in kids. And the weird thing about it is, is I write them in Ireland, nobody's any problem with that. No, people, it does really well in Ireland, and people say, keep sending me photographs of their kids reading it because in Ireland, it's very people go, oh, yeah, he likes that stuff. He's, he's probably put a bit of work into that. Like the, he, he probably, yeah, that, that's the thing Dara likes. So Dara probably, you know, we'll make an effort of that. Like, whereas here you hit a wall of, oh, but you're on the telly. What do you know about it? Like as if everything you know, and it's just very, it's a kind of like a molasses thing. You're going to sweep through of like, oh, but are the children's books authors giving it to too many celebrities? You know, geez, I've been writing for 25 years. Yeah. The, uh, it's, why is it? But it's, it's very, it's sometimes it's a very cynical place, this. It's very difficult to trudge through that at times. But to my eternal joy, Ireland remains uncomplicatedly happy about there being a funny book about space that they can enjoy. Well, this, it is the country that had the young scientist competition every year that we all grew up with. Honestly, I, I have way... Did you the, ever enter? No, I never did. I never had the... Um, I could never come up with a project for it. Went every year walked around, chatted to people, got very shy when they were girls, uh, and then... And uh, there were clever girls out there oh, no, doing no, science. Tons, like, absolutely, yeah, but I'm, look, that wasn't the thing, it was just I was I was very shy. Um, but the uh, uh, I just could never come up with a creative idea and everything to, to, to do, like whatever, and, and I, like, I was good at solving the problem, but I wasn't at it. And the sort of stuff I did was very mathsy, that was my kind of stuff, it wasn't really a, mm. a measurement type Science. thing. But mm. the... Um, uh, the I, I have toyed sometimes with there should be one of those here, and who mm. somebody should step forward and try to organize it. But God, it's such a huge country and you just blow your mind about how mm. you do it. And it's in some ways, Ireland is just the perfect size for a lot of things. And the young scientist is one of those. But I continue to, I remember meeting three 14 years in Cork, I remember, who had won it at some European thing, European science thing a couple of years ago. And they must be now in their early 20s the three most impressive young women I've ever met in my life. I was talking to whoever the European Commission was, more gay and queens, going, what about those three? And she's going, oh, look, they're, they're totally mm. going to run the place. Very and interesting to follow, to follow up on this. Yeah, I mean, it, really it, it, yeah. it finds smart people and they give them, the, I mean, these three girls during the summer holidays had taken 50,000 readings on what, what kind of fertilizer worked best on, the, on grass, like whatever, and had done a spectacular job of it. Like whatever, and you're going, okay, you're, yeah, no, there's, there's, there are fabulous people coming through. So it's a great, mm -hmm. like, great competition for that. Like, but the, mm -hmm. uh, um, so no, we have, we're, we wouldn't be great for the science traditionally in Ireland. I mean, we do tend to emphasize more writers and artists than we do scientists. The, uh, mm -hmm. but we have an honorable enough tradition. An awful lot of your uh, material is generated from the, the the difference between the two countries, Dara. Um, I, I was just wondering, because there's such a long tradition of Irish comedians doing being so successful here, why do you think that is so? What is it that we in Ireland bring to the market here? Uh, you know what? There's been a few, but like, let's not get carried away with ourselves. There's probably fewer Irish comedians than there are, you know, Scouse or bank or you know I, I I I have a kind of a bugger we we do tend to go we are aren't we great on the international stage we do so much like whatever when in fact it's like the reality is that London's just a big melting pot 
So this is like, you know, Aussie comics, and Canadian comics. This is a place to to do. I, 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 the uh, so if you're, it's it's a place that the world gathers to do stand up. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of a. It's not that I think that we bring some fabulous, unique thing that they is that we come to here and here is open to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and here is very open to there being comedy from around the world, like whatever. In a way that, for example, if you go to America, it's, it's actually much more because America has a kind of culture that has a dome over it in which they see very little coming in. So if you go to America and you're standing on stage, you're like, I'm sorry, what accent is that? Why are you talking that? It's a very kind of a different, you come from a different place. There's no sense of curiosity about that. Um, whereas in London, there is a just they're like yeah okay grand we're like we're a global city and we get stuff from all over the place so yeah i'm very happy to see on a bill a new zealand comic an irish comic an australian comic whatever uh come along and do the stuff like whatever so i yeah so i don't think we commensurately but it's a it's a it's it's next door to us and it's a and it's a great place it's just a great place to be a comic uh, the mm. UK because they're like there's a massive in normal normal times there's a massive circuit uh, and there's loads of gigs and there's loads of opportunities and then there's a general there's a whole go to Edinburgh kind of an arc um, that you can do mm. but interestingly fewer Irish have had the need to go over there's more of a need when I was going over when and before me and up to, up to about 10 years after me and then whether by example or whatever, Tommy started doing, Tommy Tierney started doing very, very well in Ireland and just popularised it. And then I would go back then and Des Bishop go back and do these long runs in Bicker Street. And Ireland became a slightly more easy place to make a living doing it. Mm -hmm. And so fewer would come over for a while. It kind of, it sways, waves go in and out uh, mm -hmm. in the nature of these things, like whatever. But I, I just am always very wary of, of our tendency to slightly self mythologize the uh, our our enormous contribution to these things the uh, because you know it's just it's it's a place that just wants lots of different voices mm -hmm. um, and it's, and it's generally very good at accepting them i know there's a perception of, of britain in the brexit kind of a way as being very kind of close it's it really isn't it's very kind of uh, it's very open to other performers coming in so yeah it's uh, it, you, the, the scope is there to do well here i wanted to ask you since you know since you written this book for children whether or not you might think about more writing you know more writing more writing for adults more you know write a novel write a sitcom write yeah. something else have you thought about that i uh, no, look i mean you write anyway because you've got it takes six months to write a, a, a stage show and it, it does um so the energy you put into writing a book and the energy you put into writing are, are kind of the same maybe you need more than more of the book because the actual weirdly the physical effort of writing actually tapping out each key is the greatest discouragement to because when you're writing for sound you just talk you just talk it out you you need a, a, the same density of ideas but you just kind of you just you just won't say them you just the conversation and then that didn't work i'll say it slightly differently next time or I'll say it slightly differently next time so you're endlessly re-editing as you do a gig when you write a, a, a small when you write a stand-up show you start with little scraps of paper with with like topics eh, is this a topic is that a topic mm. is you know breakfast buffet a topic is you know is drinking water on a zoom call to, what is that funny is that funny and you try them out in front of a small audience and stuff that the audience latch on to you expand them and you expand them. So often, a lot of the time is you will have a 25 minute show in June in Kilkenny. Um, that by the time you open the show, the proper tour at the Catalyst Festival, which is kind of a thing I use to test material, and I would have a 25 minute set there. That would be a two hour show by the time I got to Vicar Street in October. And on paper, same eight topics, but they've gone from being three minutes each to being 10 minutes each. Uh, or 15 minutes each, hopefully, whatever. Uh, the, uh, and so weirdly, the same topics then have branched off and become things from just doing it over and over and over again, right? But that type of writing, while full of ideas and, and a certain sort of an effort, is effortless in because you're just talking it. You're just, there, there's no, there's no bit where you physically have to hit the keys and you have to write the ands and the thes and the ofs. It's just flow, 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 flow. And so the bit where I've had, I've written four books so far in my life, each of them was a, at some point a slog mm. because I just go, oh Christ, do you have to actually? Yes, you do. Okay. Uh, the thing about space is, and you have to actually put the words down. So the effort i would i would sooner write a show because then i can tour it for two years two and a half years and it'll get me to i, I can do auckland i can do Reykjavik, or whatever i can i can play with it everywhere uh, than sit down and write um a book although the books are quite a satisfying thing when they're done they're very pleasing thing when they're done they're very nice to go look that all that effort went into that like whatever but the process i find just much less fun 
than the process of writing stamp. No, I understand. One of the things that uh, came across, I think, when we were doing our, our series on, on, on Irish writers was that some writers found this a very creative period and they said things like, well, this is what I do. I sit in a room all day and I write. And then other people said, oh, I, I, I'm completely blocked. I'm stuck at home and I should yeah. be churning it out and I'm not. Um, so, you know, it affects people differently. And, you know, you, you kind of yeah. shared I have, how, how I haven't written a joke. You. I haven't written a decent, and we did it for Mock the Week. We did some nice things, whatever, but nothing that I felt would, you know, would, would work for two years. Mm. The, uh, and there is a touch of, you know, a lot of comics genuinely went, well, that's me done. Um, because it was so uninspiring. I think you thought, oh, well, I, I've got nothing else to give now. Um, it's You have to kind of get out of the headspace of it. But no, it feels like stasis. It feels like it does. purgatory. So it doesn't feel like there's anything actively happening. And because there's no outlet for it, mm. and I don't want to do a Zoom conversation with a piece of paper in my hand and go, um, mm. hey, that guy not thing there. Really, the Zoom when we're doing Mock the Week is fine, but the Zoom just sitting in this room on my own, which is why I find that slightly depressing. Um, and you want, weirdly, the way it actually, the, the ideas get written is you throw something down on the page and then when you're on stage, hmm. the performance energy of being on stage, yes. generally, if you start reading it out and it's going, this is going badly, you will, your brain will panic and go, well, try this instead. Uh, and some ideas will pop out. And so they all start um, in tiny ways and, and in panic and the fear of failure. But you can't do, you can't recreate that in, you know, the bit that's most weird about the, about the gigs you do now, and I've done a fair few Zoom kind of after dinner you type things or chats of awards, and we've they tried to do versions of all these kind of things that we do, they get us to do, is that when you finish, you go, thank you very much, good night, and you press leave, the red button marked leave, and then you're in your own house, like Narnia. It's like you were suddenly in this gig, and then you're like, oh, okay, well, that's, that's over. And that is that is the most disorientating of it all. The, uh, that there's no kind of a okay, that was grand. And there's no kind of slowly coming down and chatting to other comics and saying how that go or having the organizer go that was good or having a drink or any of that stuff or milling around chatting to people and just letting it absorb. It's bing oh I'm, I'm in my house again. So <laughs> like I can walk through that door and they're all watching telly. Um, and that is that's very strange. It's like having a teleport device. The, yeah, because uh, you could disappear off and you do something then boof you're you're back again like it never happened yeah and um, so look it's not it hasn't been a help to creativity as i said some people some people as you said it's interesting those that can do it but then look there are people who get up at six in the morning and they're right you know mm. and not just that Darby, but people in the creative industry generally you know in in the theater and in, in the arts world all you know and, and and younger comedians i suppose who who are having terrible trouble trying to pay the rent or, or to survive mm. financially it is a really really tough time for people um i mean have you have you been in, in contact with with others in oh you know, yeah, yeah. dreadful yeah. situations and well no look i'm not I, I, I don't cha chapter and verse but like yeah absolutely the people i mean and they're trying to there's a kind of a scrabbling around to get any work at all the uh and look, I mean, I'm luckier in as much as I've done. I'm I'm in this year off, as I will call it, uh, off the back of immediately off the back of doing a tour, um, as opposed to uh, there was a kind of an idle game you'd play where you go, well, who's who's most been screwed by this, and you kind of look at acts who are about to break, about to do their first big tour, about to you know have a had had just had a show commissioned mm. which they can't get made now mm. or they should be basking in the success of a thing they were just about to create and now it's just gone um and so it becomes this mad they were like you had this happen 15 years earlier at the point where i was doing about doing my first tour mm -hmm. and then oh no you can feel that draining away and now got now it's what a year and a half later and suddenly the theaters will all be booked and because everyone will still suddenly the two years or three years worth of shows will now want to fit into one year and so, yeah, people will lose out. It's uh, so the losing out of it will continue for some time. The uh, and the knock-on effect of it, like whatever. I mean, I'm the one obviously you get who deserve league sympathy because I was at the, I'm at the exact perfect point to be. And to be frank, I was looking for a bit of a break anyway after this tour before I did the next tour. Mm. And then, like a weird monkey's paw, I said, "Wouldn't it be nice to have a year off stand-up?" And it all went, it all went too real for the world. So I'm sorry about that. And um, it was very much my fault. This. The, uh, so I, you're, you're all enjoying my Groundhog Day. So I should just, you know, find Andy McDowell and make her fall in love with me and then we can move on with our lives. That's 
that has to happen. I, I, I clearly haven't been watching enough television. Is there anything How that you... How have you not been watching television? We've had a <laughs> year of What have you been watching yourself? You must everything. have been. I've watched everything. <laughs> did, you get, I mean, did you say to yourself, I finally get the chance to watch Game of Thrones? Uh, no, weirdly, I, 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 I had another thing where, because I was doing a travel documentary once, and I, it was like eight hour journeys from one part of mm-hmm. Myanmar to the other. That's when I finally wanted to watch Game of Thrones. <laughs> Genuinely, I downloaded and we were, and watched the entire thing in the back of a minibus. Um, and it ended with, there's a huge battle called the Battle of the Bastards at the end of one of the series of Game of Thrones. And myself and Ed Byrne who, who watched it together on my iPad. We put the iPad on the table and we sat in chairs and watched it. And it was not how it was intended to be seen. Uh, so, I've yeah, I've done that. I've done exactly that. But uh, no, I caught up with a, you know, look, if, it's, if, it was any, if it was a decent BBC or ITV drama of the last year, I have, I have seen it uh, and if I see the American office one more time I'll scream I always have like a, a daughter who, who's getting into all these sitcoms so she she and I sit and we binge on sitcoms together which is quite a sweet thing uh, mm. so, yeah mm. that's, when you're not that's homeschooling I would know you haven't been a bit of homeschooling but that's not like <laughs> you know it's 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 happened actually the older ones are all being looked at the schools have been quite good they, yes uh, yes uh, yeah that's, yeah yeah uh, god love it yes yeah, so, no I've caught up with my content so what are you looking forward to when we're all liberated? What's the first um, thing that you're looking forward not to? Not talking to my laptop. That would be <laughs> a huge thing. Not constantly engaging with the world via this tiny camera uh, here. That would be lovely. Um, I'm looking forward to the random nature of interactions. And I mean it both on stage in terms of, hey, what do you do? And let's make up something. But also I'm looking forward to being in a bar and just bumping into somebody I haven't seen. Mm, and having a pint. That. Yeah. The, uh, it's not the booze. Because I've got the you can booze, booze at home. <laughs> booze here, I'm coming down with booze. If anything, I need a break from the booze. The uh, it's just the the randomness of geez, I've not seen you in a while. As opposed to, shall we organize a Zoom chat and we can catch mm. up and stuff? Because I found my interest wanes very quickly in those. But the uh, um, but I'm just really need that. I need just some sort of thing, just a, a night that just evolves randomly it would mm. be lovely. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, and you know what? To be back on tour, not for the gig, obviously for the gig, but for the bit where you check into the hotel at two o'clock and you go, well, I've got nothing to do before. That, that would be, and I don't have to look after any kids. Oh my God, I forgot how much I just like that. I've got a sound check at half five, sure, let's get some food at five. And, you know, but I've got the afternoon. Oh, lovely. Let's have a look around Chester or whatever, or Reykjavik or Helsinki or whatever the hell I happen to be. Let's have a bit of an explore. And, you know, that would uh, be nice. To be the master of my own time again would be great. What about what about, what about r- relations and r- relatives and family members? You know how you know lots of lots of people. You mentioned that you did actually get home in the summer. When I say yes. home, you know what I mean. Um, but a lot of people haven't. A lot of Irish people, I suppose, have have not. Uh, Irish people living here have not been able to go home, and that is something I suppose a lot of people miss. What are the things that you miss, and what are the things that you're looking forward to in terms of family? Ed, do you know, I'm really, yeah, seeing friends. it's more that I would like them to be able to go out themselves, not that I, I, I need to be there to do to see them happen. I would like my mother to get out of this lockdown that she's in mm. at the moment when I was 90. So the uh, so that'd be great. Um, but was that uh, very worrying, you know, were you very, it you know, was, very it was until I saw how well the country was doing. And then yeah. I felt a sense of that, that you know, I, I don't feel a sense of imminent danger with them. They're, they're at home, they're like they're, mm. they're in their homes, they're not in the care or whatever the situation. Okay. So, uh, and so, no, I don't feel I, at the start I was and I was doing a lot of like because there's, you know, a lot of oh, sh- look on the ground kind of a thing. And we're going, no, 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 take this seriously. But actually, the country, you know, as I said, we that, that one crazy spike where everyone bananas at Christmas and then the thing shot up that week um, and then the country locked down again. It seems to be very much more under control. So I think I think Ireland's done very well, generally, um, bar that bar Christmas um so I'm I'm not as frightened about it and uh, uh as I as I was at the start so um yeah, I think I'll get through it but you no know, more than just um uh, I would like to go back and see like because we went back we went back last summer when there was a brief window where you could mm-hmm. stay in the one place rather than it being literally in quarantine so we just stayed in a hotel and then we go and see them in very public well-aired you know we saw a lot of Wicklow's finer um gardens Let's say, you know, there's a lot of walking around Paris Court, uh, walking around um, Kilruddery, places that, you know, it's lovely to see another bush, to see another piece of topiary uh, as you talk to your mother. The, uh, and that they were the conditions under which, because my sister's over there and she was kind of marking it quite ca- carefully. So mm. uh, so we did that for a while. So that'd be nice. But look, I'm in contact with them. They're, 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 yeah. they're, they're doing OK. But if, for them, I think 
my mother's a very social animal. I think she'd like to be literally same as myself. Would like to be having the random interactions in the chats with people. Mm. So that would be great. And as somebody who's lived here since around the two thousand and two mark, I think. I mean, what what are the kind of things that you what are the things that you miss about Ireland? Uh, I suppose I miss the the, the randomness, the size with the, the shared hinterland of that we're all kind of. There's a casualness about Irish people that I find very very enjoyable. A level of um, acknowledgement of each other it, it, in a way that how best to put this I, I like I think a lot of the mythologies I need to do as you can see I'm 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 over it uh the well we're uniquely we love music uh, cavemen love music <laughs> everybody loves music right we don't have a unique thing on that oh but we love to laugh everybody loves to laugh it's like a human thing babies love to laugh it's grand so stop claiming these things these not these human it's the British do this as well oh but we are very you know we have great fairness every Everyone likes fairness. No, it's not just a unique but everyone likes fairness. There's a lot of these things that, that countries adopt around themselves. What I feel is a genuine thing is that we have an informality in Ireland, which I find always very, very comfortable. The, uh, the uh, sort of, uh, sure, I know you. Sure, I know you. It's grand. Mm. Sure, yeah. The, uh, and we're not in, there isn't a kind of whole class thing, which is great. Um, mm -hmm. And, or at least not as pronounced as it is here. And there's a kind of a just general needing to check in with each other, which I find because my wife is English, it's, it, we'll go, if we're away on holiday somewhere, um, the the example I was given is we're away somewhere, somewhere, I don't know where it was, but we're in a hotel breakfast buffet type situation, and we're here saying, and someone would walk past the table with an English accent and she would not, you know, she, she would make a look up. Um, but an Irish accent, I am like a meerkat, and I pop my head up, like whatever, and I make eye contact, and we nod, and we nod, and there you go. And there is that urge just to check in, you know. There is. And I, if they, if they hear my, oh, 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 you know, oh, here we are, uh, kind of a thing, which I find quite warm as a thing, you know. I'm, I, there's a lot of the stuff, as I said, that I uh, shun a lot of the kind of more ah, sure, we're Irish kind of stuff that I can live without. But I just find when that's watered down into just, Look, we've a level of informality with each other um, that uh, I find that quite pleasing. They, so. And do you feel very comfortable here now, of having having you know made made your home here and yeah, you know, no, your I family do, here, I do, your yeah, career? Yeah. You, do you feel very comfortable with that kind of duality of being able to go over over and back and be one thing and be the other thing? Weird. I think I need. I think Whatever. I need both. I think mm. I need to be able to do that um, and be able to uh, sir, recharge it, as it were, like a video game character who needs to get their health gauge back up again. I need occasion to go back and, and do that. And the joy of doing things like um, a comedy tour is that you get to go back a lot, for example. So I get to see. Um, I'll do like ten weekends in Dublin on the tour. And that sounds ridiculous because I could, I should just play a slightly bigger room or whatever, and then just do them all in a box. But I then get ten weekends in Dublin, and so I'll see college friends, school friends, um, you know, old mates from, the, from when I was living there in my twenties, like whatever. And I'll just, I'll just get to be in the city properly, um, and so I get a sense of the place again. So I, so I, it's a privilege I have that I get to go back and do it, see it as often as I do. I haven't for a while now, but the. Uh, it's a uh, so I feel very much more in touch. I still feel that it's it's moving away from me as an immigrant. You know, its passions are moving away from me, and that's 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 the process. That's the way it goes. Do, do you feel that, Darren? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you mean? So. What do you mean by that? Uh, see, I think that the thing that makes you different, and the thing that makes you foreign when you go back, isn't the grand grand scale scale of things. Isn't the DNA? Your DNA doesn't change in any way. But what actually defines a nation and what they think is the day to day of what they talk about and what they've lived through together. So I come back and I've not been around for, I've not done this last experience with them. I wasn't there for the, you know. The lockdown. Uh, yeah, but equally I wasn't there for the last two referenda or for the, right. you know, these, you know, these things, mother and babies homes and all these kinds of scales. These, I haven't been living these. I haven't been living what was, who's, who's the current, you know, uh, big TV phenomenon or the big pop phenomenon. That's, that's actually weirdly, especially when you're, as a comedian, that's culture. That's the thing that defines it. It's that day to day of, of oh, have you noticed that now the radio stations are all doing this? That is yeah. the stuff that makes it. And that's the stuff that when you come over, after being away for 30 years, makes the place. Obviously, Stephen's Green was still like Stephen's Green. Obviously, if you do a blood test on me, I will have the same DNA I had, whatever, 30 years ago. But the, all the country's shared experiences, I won't have been involved in. So it's kind of funny to feel that drift um, away from me. Um, and fine, that's the way it has to be, like whatever. And sometimes it's a funny thing to joke with them about. The, uh, there was a weird preponderance of, um, of I'll, I'll say it to you, it'll mean nothing to you. 
but I was in Dublin the last time I was over for, for, for H and Vicar Street. I was going look. I would give the speech about how yeah you move. It's weird. I see you move apart. I see you become obsessed with things that make me feel more like an immigrant than I was. And the audience would all go no. And I go so basically, what's the fuck with all the donuts? And we get this huge applause because Dublin had. 45 donut shops suddenly that appeared for six months and were everywhere and you couldn't get away from donuts in Dublin. And I say this to you now to a look of obviously blank because it didn't happen in no, London. No, Dublin's, no. Dublin's like this weird Petri dish of weird trends that pop up like whatever and they really go for them in a big way and but then they, they have, go away they again. They called spice bags. Oh no, spice well, bags are for London. Spice bag is, is uh, spi- yeah, spice bag is a thing from a chipper. Um, I, we don't I, have that here. No, they don't. No, no, they don't have the same. Look, they don't have... They don't have, they don't call them, you know, dinner boxes either uh, here. And their, and their curry sauce is different. Let's not get into the semiotics of chip shops. They, <laughs> well, uh, you know, there is lockdown. Food is about the only thing we I know, I know, I know. But, to, but, but no, no, I know what you mean. That, and and but also, but I wonder if that's a generational thing, Dara, as well. But that, that becomes, a, like, because in 30 years' time, that's it. I'm a generation yeah. away from knowing what the hell they're talking about, right? Mm. And so you're only, up, like, I constantly have this thing of now in between the two things where we would have Americans come over and Americans not get uh, the culture and what, what what's going on here because they've been they were dipped in amber they were in aspect whatever they were like they were they were trapped in this old image of what it was used to be like and the country keeps evolving keeps moving on like whatever and that's what it's absolutely what it's supposed to do um although my current theory which i'm very interested in the moment is, is the why it is that Amer- irish when they say irish in america it's it's so different to us I, to Irish, Irish, Bosco Irish, as I call them, people who know who Bosco is. Um, I don't know who Bosco yeah, is. exactly. I know Bosco's you're, mommy. You're, you're, you're Bosco Irish. The, uh, it's Somebody else will come and think that, that doesn't include us, by the way. Uh-huh. But because the, there are other kids' TVs happening at the moment. Uh, the, <laughs> but uh, Bosco Irish would be people who grew up there, for, as opposed to I'm Irish, as in like my grandparents were Irish, right? That was my phrase I would always use. And uh, I realized that the reason they were so different, that the Irish in America were so different to Irish is because they define themselves as being different to other immigrant communities that they had mm-hmm. come through in America at the same time. So for the Irish American was like, we're Irish, we're not Italian, we're Irish, we're not Jewish, we're not Mexican, whatever, we're Irish, we're different from these people, right? And they define their characteristics as being different from these people. Where the Irish in Ireland spend very little time going, I wonder what the Italians, the Jews and the Mexicans are doing. So they haven't defined themselves in any way in relation to them. So this, when you come in and go, well, I'm Irish, which means I'm this and this. And we go, the fuck is that? Um, it's because that means something in a cultural context that we're not in either. And so I'm trying to find a way to work. Now I'm, you know, Irish over here. Mm-hmm. We're also drifting apart from it. So the, 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 it never stays the same. It moves, it changes, and you have to let that go. That's the, mm. that's the enjoyment. I'm very lucky I get back, get to go back semi regularly, and watch this happen. But there are things that I see out, and I go, I don't know who you're talking about. Don't know. I've never seen this television show. I don't know who this current celebrity is. People's careers have come and gone in the gaps between my tours, and I've come back and suddenly everyone's gone. And I go, who the hell was that? And said, oh yeah, that was big six months ago. They're gone now. You know, it's it changes. It moves on. And it does. So I'm clinging on to it by a rock again. <laughs> um, I, I was just wondering though, when you said about your children, you know, obviously the, their mom is, is English and, and you're Irish. And how do you kind of negotiate that? Uh, it's something that a lot of people over here have to negotiate, shall we say, in terms of, you know, how, how do you explain this? Or how do you, how, you know, this, this whole Irish English thing to them? Uh, their grandma is the thing that they can dip into uh, as they wish. I'm not raising them in a plastic kind of way, if you know what I mean. That, that's a horrible term, but I'm not mm, doing it. Horrible the- term. It's a terrible term for, for like a, just a desire to, you know, be in touch culturally. I get that. But the but I'm not we, they're not doing any of that stuff. It's, it's their own life. They'll pick their own, make their own choices. It's there for them. And it's a thing that I, uh, you know, the only way in which we I impose, as it were, um, anything in my culture is that every start of every summer we do a draw for who's going to win uh, the hurling and they each get two counties. Uh, and so I think my daughter won it this year. Uh, she got Limerick. Uh, and we've been to a few hurling matches, which they've enjoyed. They uh, well, probably because they got sweets. Uh, and they, so they'll things like that. They'll see bits of. You know, I make a point of standing up and singing the anthem uh, if it's played. The uh, which is not a, a pleasant experience. Uh, but I don't. I'm like I'm not. They're they're not being raised in a in a kind of a, a Irish and abroad kind of a way. It's yeah, there for them yeah. to take from and draw from and 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 use as they will. I mean, they're going to be spelling their names for the rest of their lives. But there you go. Um, and did you give them Irish names? Oh yeah, I mean, because they're O'Brien anyway, so they have to. You might as well go the whole hog like. Mm-hmm. So they yeah. So oh no, yeah. the shavus and everything. They yeah, <laughs> so they're in massive trouble. But um, 
it's uh, so so we don't do that. And then my wife is from Yorkshire, which is kind of an interesting cultural thing in itself, separate from like you know people from Yorkshire regard themselves as being a kind of a, a separate cultural and national identity anyway. So that happens. It's only kind of weird things like, for example, um, those sweets, the uh, round trees you used to do, the fruit. What are they called again? Um, oh, you know those the round fruit trees. pastilles. Thank you. What, say that word again. Pastilles. There we go. An Irish person says pastille. I was just testing you there. A, a British people say pastels, fruit oh, pastels. Well, that, scone's gone, you know. You know, but I, you know, the more <laughs> this one's correct because if pastille is, I, I even looked up while they're all laughing at me because I was talking about fruit pastilles and it said it's pastels, I said it's pastilles. And I'm looking it up going, and it's on the website of a round tree going, um, well, pastille was obviously named at the French word pastille, which rhymes with Bastille, right? And I'm reading this to them and they don't do not care. And I said, but but a Yorkshire pronunciation because round trees in York um, always pronounce it as pastels. So that's what they say. And so we have this conversation, but like little things like that, little shibboleths like that appear where yes. I will come at them with the Irish slash correct thing. Yes. Uh, and they will go, no. Like the letter, the letter R or the letter OR, as we say it, that kind of stuff. They're little snag points, which are kind of funny to have. Little yes, points of detection yes. in, a, in a family, uh, which are quite nice. Look, it's, it's there for them to, to draw yes. from. Yes, yes, absolutely. It's like those, those uh, the internet quizzes, 15 things you'll only know if you're Irish. Question yeah. one, what yeah. is a hot press? Exactly, that kind of stuff. <laughs> I don't know how well they do. They might buy... <laughs> Just by, you know, I was going to say by immersion, but it's by um, uh, induction, whatever the first um, osmosis. They might pick up a few of those kind of things, like whatever. But this is, mm. you know, uh, w one of the joys of it. I mean, there is a thing that I, we may make a documentary for the BBC, a travel documentary in Ireland. We may do one at some stage. It's this talk of doing something. And the whole point I would do would be things that are perfectly normal in Ireland, but foreign for here. Um, mm. and do that as, as, as a basis for it, like whatever stuff that you just we're not some tour or wonderland but we are different we're a different country with different this 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 and this like whatever and so I think that's a an important thing to assert every so often in case mm. you know here they just become oh you're just hard that's just like here mm. no so there you go Mm. There's just one final thing I wanted to ask you, yeah. Dara, um, it's a, on a personal matter. Um, you did an interview recently in which you talked about um, uh, the search for your birth mother and you mentioned there about the mother and baby homes. And I'm conscious that if there was somebody watching this who might be an admirer of yours and who might be thinking of going on the same process, is there any word of advice that you'd give to them? Well, let's start, if, if you're considering doing this, like whatever, I'm sort of in the middle of doing it. And I came, did an interview about it recently deliberately to just do to just get it done say it you know whatever and as a point thank you for not bringing it till now because i generally don't want to go over the whole story again no you don't um, want to be defined no, by it no but also it's kind of a thing that i've spoken but it's about out there a, now a bit. it's out there now it's grand it's fine and what it allows me to do is i may do one or two things where i explain parts of the story and i may then see if it's a story that i can tell in a way that you know on stage and see if i can draw out the bits of it like whatever so it's out there it's not a big surprise uh, or a big reveal um, but also the other advantage of doing it was is that there was a campaign in Ireland for adoptees to get their birth cert, um, which is bizarrely not available to them now. The, uh, if you apply to get information as an adopted person in Ireland, you receive a redacted form of information and you literally receive sheets, sheets of things with the word redacted written on them and all the information blanked out. And I know people who have gone so far as to be in contact with their birth parents or at least we, uh, and, and even then aren't allowed to get the information about them. And they're going, but no, I've, I brought her along. We're the two people mentioned in that kind of, you know, it, not quite that, but uh, you, there is an element to it. Like it's, it's a ridiculous thing. We, interestingly, if you're in the UK uh, and the situations, you can, because the law apparently allows you to, if, you're, if you've moved to the UK, allows you to get your birth date in Ireland. I think that's the case, right? But if you're in Ireland, no. The, if I was giving any advice to somebody, it would be start the process now because mm. it's a slow process. It, and takes it's a, it takes time and given that the information is held by another body and they won't tell you anything um you need them to be it, they will they will help you and and actually a lot of the help they give you is, is very good because sometimes it's good to put the brakes on it's good to have somebody going okay managing your expectation about how this will work and what will occur here um but it is also frustrating to be um at arm's length and to be talking to somebody and then to know that they have they are literally reading your birth set but you can't have it and that is frustrating so that's the campaign we're trying to change it the uh, i mean there are ways of doing detective work if you can get some of it like specifically your first name um then you can you can find it 
and they're in, in the most Irish way. That's the other not the most Irish thing we have, an Irish solution to an Irish problem. When you go to find it, they know what you're doing and they really want to help you, but they know they can't just help you. Um, so they have to encourage you, G you along to do it. But you're in you, there's a room you can go to with all the births of everything and you can and you can hunt it down. But you probably won't get your first name because of GDPR of all things. So there's a series of um, obstacles um, put in the way of people trying to find their birth parents in Ireland. And part of the reason I think is that you do actually, if you opened all the information up, you'd find out just how much stuff was was missing anyway and how much stuff was obscured or obfuscated or, or or just made absent like i mean there's you know there's there's not a lot of information about birth fathers at all if anything they're, they're entirely written out of the process um and so uh, it would be a thing that you know at, at all times the best time to start the process is now and then as it's going trust me you'll have plenty of time to deal with your emotions and feelings about it because mm. it will take a long time so the uh, mm. it's not like it's it's going to happen quickly. So um, yeah, it can be it can be weird. And also, when you work at, when you're living in this era where you think, well, I can just find out something, I can just tap tap tap, and it'll all be there. It's not, and mm. that is that is bizarre, and it feels really weird in this day and age. You can't just well, I'll just, I'll just tap it in now. I'm sure there's a database, and I'll just type in, bang, there we go. No, there's genuinely a yeah, uh, I need to slowly go through this. So the uh, mm -hmm. it's weird. I don't think any. It would uh, make any harm for them a bit more sunlight let in on this. Um, and the current thing in Ireland with the mother and baby homes has only accelerated that need. Absolutely. Do you feel yourself, I know you said it's a process that you're still going through and it's early days yet, but do you feel uh, that it's kind of uh, changed in any way or made you more, I don't know, reflective or... I, look, I, I, I don't think the process has the um, but it has put a cast of ca other characters into my life, which is an mm. interesting thing. But look, I you know, as I say, we were kind of in the midst of it all. It was all going happening, and then COVID happened, and mm. it's all kind of been put on hold. Mm. And so it's very difficult actually. Get, you can't, can't meet anyone, for example. Mm. The yeah, uh, mm. so it's a yeah, uh, so that's kind of a slow thing. But the uh, but I have had contact with a sister and a brother and some people that they. Uh, you know, and and the, and uh, and my birth mother, and it'll uh, the, the more that kind of normalizing would would happen if it was possibly in the same room as them, but I can't. So look, I'm I'm kind Absolutely. of keeping it kind of light in terms of detail. Of course, yeah, the, uh, yeah. But uh, in terms of people, I suppose you know the fact that you are in the public eye, it almost you know it does. Uh, I suppose have an impact on on um, on anybody yeah. watching in the same way as I think you know you said that the the film Philomena had an influence on it you. Did. I mean, it was one you of know, the reasons so. that I did this is because I saw because I, I you know about this in your chart and you kind of going well, do I want to do this? Do I want to do the search? And then I realized from watching Philomena that I actually had a responsibility to a certain extent. Uh, to contact my birth mother and go look look I, I it worked out I've got great parents and we have a fantastic relationship and that was all very fine but you know just so you know um that that would be a case like whatever so that was actually a more of a nudge uh like that you know that not only do you have is it a story that you can find out about yourself but you possibly I have a responsibility I don't want to put any pressure on anyone in this but like you can do this you can actively do this and you can actually answer a question for somebody else as well it's not just a question for you but it's a question for somebody else as well uh, and so that was um a strange uh, feeling of oh my god I, I i haven't had that tilted on its axis and for it just not to be a an idle curiosity of mine uh, as much as it is also a responsibility i might have so you know, mm -hmm. but again, look, I, you, you don't want to put everyone's journey in this is very, very different. Mine came from an incredibly secure emotional place. The uh, yeah. kind of, it, it was never, I never felt it was part of my identity. I don't suddenly feel I'm a different person for having discovered what I've discovered. And um, there's a line I put down and was talking to somebody going, it answers nothing in the sense of you keep thinking, well, maybe this is why I, I'm tall, I'm bald, I'm into science or whatever. Yeah. None of that, it doesn't any of that. When you meet people, they're not like some cartoon version exactly the same of you. Like, oh my God, how did I not see this before? Like whatever. They're just other people. They're just these other people who you have this kind of like, a, oh, okay, hi. Um, so it's not like it, it does, a, for me anyway, it was a jigsaw piece missing and then I found that piece and I put it into the, there's not, it's not a, that kind of neat resolution. It's just, it feels like more threads woven into a tapestry. That's a very nice way of putting it. And I think probably you've had enough 
of being on Zoom now at this point. <laughs> uh, you know, honestly, in both in the macro sense uh, and in the micro sense, <laughs> they, uh, it'd be nice to do any of this uh, face to face. That'd be a yes, and we hope you know that one day you will uh, join us down in the Irish Cultural Centre in Hammersmith. Look, my 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 huge. There's two things I've done in the Irish Cultural Centre that are outstanding for me. Various, I've had various evenings there, but I won't. I gave blood there. Uh, for the first time in the UK. I think I, I, a trend I've continued, but they've moved it now from the Irish Culture Centre to, weirdly, the church in Hammersmith. So I'd given blood on the altar, uh, which felt almost satanic, but it was just a kind of, a, that was a room that was available. Uh, and also I met Enda Kenny there, uh, the Irish <laughs> teacher who happened to be over, and I walked in and I think he was doing so hello to him, like whatever. So I have a very weird scattered um, collection of, of experiences in that in that room. Uh, here's to more of them. Uh, here's to more weird scattered collections. We'll, talk, we'll try and make it as random as possible. <laughs> Look, this is, that's all I ask. All I ask is I walk in and go, geez, what are you doing here? That's all, <laughs> I, that's all I ask. <laughs> we'll give you a pint anyway, that'll relax Thank you. you. Daria O'Brien, thank you so much for joining us today and um, the best of luck. We look forward to seeing much. you in the flesh. Lovely. Slow. All the best.